As far as the church itself, it was it was a, a, quite an experience to be in the school. Um, the setup, the, the service itself, the basketball and takedown afterwards, um, that created a lot more opportunity for fellowship. And I was amazed at how many, you know, we, we joined it for church, but yet we ended up making so many friends because there was so much interaction. My first real memory is actually when we had already bought the, the land for the church building and we all went up there as a congregation and with an old manual plow carved the, a cross in the church in the dirt. And then the other thing was during the building we all put little notes and Bible verses and stuff in the studs. So that's still there, I think, for most of it, and that's kind of cool. I found it to be very low-key. I mean, just a very relaxed atmosphere. It's, it, it, it just didn't seem to be as formal and well, and the kids were often in, in church part of the time. And they were, we had a lot of young kids, so there was a little noise going on and it echoed in the in the gym but it was uh, it was a lot of fun it was just part of the atmosphere that and donuts afterwards basketball and donuts <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel any of the challenge. I think the person who had most of the challenge was Bill. Because we were, I think, happy in the church we were going to at the time. We drove over, we lived in Heartland, but we drove to Delafield. Uh, and we didn't really give it much thought until one day he was at our door. Bill was at our door and explaining to, him, to us what he was doing with the new church here. And by the time we were done with the meeting, we felt like we were friends and we would definitely give it a try. So the next Sunday we were at Lakeside. And I think one thing that um, he said at that first meeting, and it's true today, the church is not a building, it's not the pastor, it's the community of faith. <clears throat> and that intrigued us. And uh, not being quite as formal, we were very young. We had just had our second child. Um, a lot of the people in the group were kind of in that same age group. So it was a little chaotic and a little um, different, but everybody had lots of enthusiasm, and we had a lot of growing to do, both personally and as a church. I don't know that I felt challenged, but you just felt energized. Making so many new friends and you look forward to working together with people or whatever we needed to do to move ahead. I mean, I'm thinking when the school was there, but there was a lot of work to be done when we started to, to acquire the land and start to build the first church. So I got pretty involved in that. I was on the church building committee. And so we, uh, I think I was at the church during construction virtually every day, so it became quite a part of my, my normal life. It was your baby. <laughs> <laughs> but we did enjoy it. We had, <laughs> there was a lot of enthusiasm, and I do think part of it was the fact that people, it was a very young group of people at that time. Um, it was great that we got more diversified as far as age later on, but I think that early group um, had so much enthusiasm and part of it was just because they were young themselves. Um, lots and lots of effort and activity and enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. This is a much more difficult time. I mean, whether we had a place to meet or not, you could always find a place to meet 
in the early days. And you, now that you can't meet, I mean, that's that makes it so much more difficult. We have all a, a, everything is structured and put together already. It's just a matter of almost uh, you stay in touch as much as you can and bide your time because I don't know that I could be wrong, but I don't think I see us in the church again until there's a vaccine. So that could be next year. I do think that virtual worship has helped tremendously with that, at least for me. Um, and also it's a time of, for me of more personal reflection, um, more into my daily personal devotions. Um, you know, and I also feel like, you know, this, this too will pass and we'll be okay. Everybody's in the same boat and we'll be okay. I personally love the, the, the direction that the church has taken in the past couple of years of more outreach. Um, I, I've always felt that that really is the church's goal is to reach out and do things of service in the community and I, I saw how that pro, how the programs were really developing in that regard and I think that's great. Um, I wish I could give a magic <laughs> you know had a magic spell and say wow this is you know if we just do this we'll have exponential growth and everybody will get so involved. I know that's not going to happen but um, I do think we're on the right track. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The reading today comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. A right relationship with God is not something we achieve by heroic efforts. It is a gift received in the proclamation whose content is Jesus Christ. This proclaimed word creates our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, Christian proclamation is an indispensable component of God's saving actions. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For if everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on the one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Hi, it's Pastor Kim coming to you from my dining room pulpit on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Our gospel reading appointed for this day comes to us from Matthew, the 14th chapter. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, there he was alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. 
Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him saying, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped Jesus saying, truly, you are the son of God the Gospel of our Lord. Long ago in seminary, I had a classmate who repeatedly defined faith as stepping out of an airplane without a parachute, knowing that God will catch you. His life, up until the time I became acquainted with him, had obviously been one without any major traumas. He had never needed to step out of his proverbial airplane without a parachute, nor could any of his life experiences be likened to being pushed out of that airplane. My thought every time I heard his definition of faith was that surely God had better things to do than to catch people stupid enough to step out of airplanes without anything to keep them from falling to their deaths. Matthew's story of Jesus walking on the water with Peter can spawn bad theologies, theologies like that of my former classmate. Peter's escapade of stepping over the side of the boat can be twisted and turned into evidence that God asks us to demonstrate our faith by taking pointless risks. Or Jesus' reproof, you of little faith, why did you doubt, can cause some to teach and some to believe that if our faith were only strong enough, no harm would ever befall us. Setting the bar that high for faith can result in feeling afraid to admit our fears and doubts to others, to ourselves, and most especially to God. What's more, when bad things happen in life, and they will, we may believe that our lack of faith caused this harm, or that God isn't powerful enough or compassionate enough to protect us. Now, I really believe that my seminary classmate overrated the case. God does not call us to stop thinking or to risk our lives and welfare pointlessly. But apparently, at least at that point in his life, he had a sense of safety and security so deep that he was for a time beyond fear and anxiety. As we read today's gospel passage from Matthew, we learn that when Peter was assured that the shadowy figure on the water was Jesus himself, he too demonstrated for a moment that same lack of fear and anxiety. When he knows that it is actually Jesus walking toward him on the water, Peter asked Jesus to dare him to join him on the surface. And with the utmost faith in Jesus, Peter steps out of the boat and he walks on the water. Step after step, Peter walks until he's distracted by the storm all around him. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and becomes, understandably, afraid. Peter's growing awareness of the wind and the waves reminds me of that old Roadrunner cartoon when the coyote chases the Roadrunner off the cliff. The Roadrunner always makes it across the gap, but every time the coyote halfway across the chasm becomes aware that there's nothing beneath his feet. He stops cold in his fear and then plummets down to the bottom of the canyon. You know, it's kind of the same thing when you watch a young child learning how to walk. He or she will toddle many steps across the floor 
until the re realization suddenly hits that there are no hands holding him up. So the child will collapse in a heap of fear. We all have moments, large and small, when we suddenly feel all alone and without sure footing. Those moments may be about brought about by the outside world where pressures to succeed and to do more and to have more collide with not enough time or energy or resources to accomplish what the world expects of us. Our unsure footing may be in our personal lives when we're faced with failing health or the loss of loved ones or broken relationships. The winds and the waves come dangerously close and we get scared. And these days, after months of physical distancing, working from home, and feeling lonely and disconnected because of the pandemic, we definitely feel that we're not on solid ground because, well, nothing is definite these days. Jesus asks, why did you doubt? And I want to jump in to defend Peter. Hello, Lord! waves, wind, not to mention that it simply isn't possible to walk on water. The truth is, to be afraid and to doubt in the face of danger is human. If God's demand of us is not to fear and not to doubt, then we're asked to do a task far more impossible than Peter's stepping out onto the sea. But, Think about this. What if we hear Jesus' words, why do you doubt, not so much as a rebuke, but as a word of encouragement? Jesus already knows and accepts Peter's limitations, so maybe what he's really saying is, oh, you were doing it. You had it. Keep it up. Don't lose that. Maybe Jesus is saying to Peter exactly what we say to the toddler learning to walk or, or to the child who's attempting to ride a, a bike without training wheels. You've got it. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't lose it. Because, you see, while our salvation is settled once and for all, while our identity in Christ is settled once and for all, our faith is never settled once and for all. We momentarily grasp God, or I guess more accurately, for a moment we realize that God grasps us. And then the world or the trials of everyday life intervene, and somehow that certainty slips away. We never get to completely check off, have faith on our list of accomplishments in this life. It won't be until the next life that we won't be distracted by something which pulls our eyes and our focus off of Jesus, causing our faith to falter and our fears to overtake us. Today's story from Matthew serves as a reminder that our faith is an awful lot like Peter's. But, you know, that's not such a bad thing. Remember, it's Peter's faith in Jesus which lets him step out of the boat in the first place. And just as importantly, Peter's faith in Jesus prompts him to call for his help when he begins to sink. Just as it was for Peter, Jesus' love for you and for me is shown in his promise that he is trustworthy and true, that he will not let us down. It was the love of Jesus for his disciples which sent him walking out into the storm to find them in the first place. It was that relationship of love and trust which led Jesus to chide Peter's lapse of faith while at the same time rescuing him. And maybe, as I mentioned, that chide was not a chide, but words of encouragement. Many times I have felt as if I'm on my own boat after Jesus has sent me ahead to cross the sea while he stayed back to tie up a few loose ends. 
There have been times and situations in my life where I felt all alone, as if I were steering my boat against the wind and the waves. Times when I hadn't even stepped out of the boat, but had been thrown out of it. Do you know what I mean? I'll bet you do. Jesus, though, has been there to rescue me every time. Dear friends, our stories and our circumstances might be different, but I have no doubt that you have struggled on stormy waters too. Maybe you are right at this moment. You know all about wind and waves and unsure footing. Yet the fact that you're watching and listening to our virtual worship service proves that you have experienced in one way or many Jesus reaching out his hand to catch you in the sustenance of prayer, word, and sacrament, in the love of family and friends, in the bond of community, and in those rare but palpable moments of unexplainable peace and assurance in the midst of your struggles and fears. Jesus has been there to rescue you each and every time. Now, some of you may know that to celebrate my birthday in June, I did actually jump out of an airplane, but I was safely harnessed to an experienced skydiver who had not only one parachute, but a spare as well. You see, God does not demand that we step out of airplanes without parachutes, simply to prove the strength of our faith. But like Peter, we can step forward, even if the ground beneath us is no more substantial than water. What matters is that we are walking toward Jesus, whose hand is always held out to you and to me, stretched out in invitation and encouragement, stretched out to grasp us if we fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Together, let us confess our holy Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For your whole church throughout the world, give courage in the midst of storms so that we may see and hear Jesus calling, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. May we follow Christ wherever he leads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the well-being of your creation, protect waterways and forests, lands and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. Help the human family endeavor to sustain and be sustained by the resources of your hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the nations and their leaders, in you, steadfast love and faithfulness meet, and righteousness and peace kiss. May nations in conflict know the peace that is the fruit of justice and the justice that is the path to peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in need, everyone who calls upon your name will be saved. Be with all who are ill, lonely, or grieving. Hear the voices of those who cry out in anguish and support those who are frustrated by life circumstances. We pray for those suffering this day, especially those we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our congregation, you've gathered us virtually as your people and we thank you for this gift. We long to worship together in your house, but we act ask that you give us patience until we can do so safely. Thank you for the opportunities for worship that you've provided through our leaders and our volunteers. Supply us generously with your grace for our life together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for the saints of the whole church from all times and places, and for the saints in our lives and in our community whom you've gathered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.